evangelism. Not a word you don't like to hear. How come? How come folks like you and me, you and I, we don't like to hear the word evangelism? I can think of several reasons, but no doubt we've all encountered evangelism in a way that blames us for not doing more. I certainly hear this all the time as a pastor, both from the laity and from the denominational leadership. And no doubt you too have heard it from pastors and various sort of parachurch ministries. If all of us just worked a little harder, then more people would join Jesus. Surely it's got a grain of truth to it. But that's just not how it works, really. Right? Sweating and grunting themselves do not expand the kingdom. Perhaps a better understanding of evangelism would help us. One that doesn't rely on specialized techniques or detailed lawyerly knowledge of the Bible and doctrine. One that doesn't rely on charisma and showmanship and pressure and high emotions. And a better understanding also wouldn't try to define the word with the word, right? As in, evangelism means sharing the good news. Sort of like answering the question, Hey, waiter, what's the soup du jour? Oh, that's the soup of the day. Oh, I'll have that, right? So how simple can we make the concept of evangelism? How about seven words? Seven words. Introducing my friends to my friend Jesus. Easy. Easy to remember. Now, most of you, right, I would hope all of you, have friends and relations, kith and kin, outside of this room. Like I said, I hope all of you, but I don't know, maybe not all of you, right? <laughs> and those folks, right, they're not here with us yet, either in this very congregation or in another congregation, right? And let's say, just a rule of thumb, let's say at least four times a year, right? They are the people for you to show and tell about Jesus. Oh, pastor, more show and tell. You always say show and tell, pastor. Well, I do, yes. It's because I learned it from a, la from a man a lot smarter about these matters than any two or even three of us. I use show and tell because it's a very simple way to conceptualize ministry. Right? Ministry shows us about Jesus, say, in the bread and the wine or in works of mercy. It tells us about Jesus, say, in our prayers or in preaching. Evangelism requires both. Right? So perhaps hosting a blood drive, as we do today, shows. But we need to tell the right thing, too. How come y'all always have those blood drives at St. Peter? Because the need for blood is great. Or, because as a follower of Jesus, it's a great way to care for my neighbor. Which combo shows and tells? Right. Showing and telling are never far from one another. Now these two things, introducing my friends, to my friend Jesus, by showing and telling about him, lead us to what we read in Psalm 1 today. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seats of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. For those of you who learned it in the old-fashioned King James. But we also need verse 3. The righteous are like trees planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season, with leaves that do not wither. Everything they do shall prosper. Now, traditionally, Psalm 1 is seen as a messianic psalm, primarily looking forward to Jesus' life. It was likely written, I don't know, a thousand years or so before Jesus' birth. And question number two on your green study and share inserts will take you a little deeper here as what's going on with the psalm and how important it is to the Bible. Now certainly, our 
only claim to righteousness is through Jesus. By being joined to his death and to his resurrection in holy baptism, receiving his gift of righteousness. Right? His innocent suffering and death on the cross, shedding his holy and precious blood for us, for you and for me, brings us forgiveness, new life, and salvation. And that word righteousness means to be right with God. It's still a little bit like defining a word with the word, we already said. So let's put it this way. Righteousness is things the way God intends them. And so, God intends for us to say, to delight in his will and walk in his ways to the glory of his name, of his holy name. He intends for us, as the third commandment is explained, that we may not despise preaching and his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear it and learn it. In other words, meditate on it day and night. And so it is for us. First joined to Jesus and anointed with the Holy Spirit, that second, such things happen in our everyday lives. Indeed, they really do happen and we really do them. Happily even. I suppose we could really dig down deep in the grammar and the vocabulary and the meter and structure of Psalm 1, but I don't think that's necessary today. Right, looking at the big picture works for us today. The faithful, the righteous ones are like mighty trees, right? mighty live oaks, those beloved Texas Quercus fusiformis with holy baptism as the ever-flowing stream. Having received the gift of righteousness, let me repeat that, having received the gift of righteousness, the gift of faithfulness, they know to avoid sin, to pursue the things of the Spirit rather than the world, the desires of the flesh. All right, that's Galatians chapter 5 for you when you get home. You can remember, just write G5 on your sheet. That's enough to remember it. But it's more than that. Consider the word happy. And no doubt some of you are ready to issue me a correction that happiness is a feeling while joy is a fruit of the Spirit or some such thing. And you think that you can appeal to me by using the word feeling because you know that usually I'm not a fan of going by our feelings. And you'd be right. If happiness, as it's used here in the Bible today, was merely a feeling. In fact, it's the same word that gets translated as blessed, right? As number three on your sheets shows you, right? And so this holy happiness, this theological happiness isn't a mere fleeting feeling, right? In fact, it's the solid ground for our feelings as Jesus suggests in the Sermon on the Plain. Right, we can honestly translate the Sermon on the Plain or the Sermon on the Mount with happy instead of blessed, right? In fact, famously, um, Robert Schuller did a sermon series, The Be Happy Attitudes, all about the Beatitudes, even when things are falling down around us and falling apart, the surety and the certitude that God and his promises are in fact for you changes the outlook. And Jesus says as much to his disciples in Luke chapter 6. I'm reminded of Phil Robertson, right? He's the founder of Duck Commander, patriarch of the Duck Dynasty crowd. You remember that TV show from a few years back? This is a quote of his. Happy, happy, happy. Right, name of a book that he wrote. And I suppose it's easy for a multi-millionaire celebrity to be happy, right? But then it's just as easy for them to be a suspicious crank, too. Now, Phil will tell you that his happy, happy, happy comes from... Right, you might want to write this down. You ready for it? I'm going to tell you the secret. Write it down. Phil tells you that happy, happy, happy comes from none other than Jesus and his righteousness. In receiving this holy happiness, in the living waters of holy baptism, anointed with the Holy Spirit, we're not ashamed of holiness. In fact, we're happy about it. We're happy to tell and show others about it. So we're talking about everyday lives filled up with weekly worship, 
daily prayers, Bible reading, looking out for our neighbors, holding them in our prayers, encouraging them with true and honest biblical hope. Besides, you all have small catechisms at home. Right? If you don't, tell me. I'll give you one this morning. But from the Ten Commandments in the beginning all the way to the table of duties at the end, the catechism will guide you in holiness. See, so we don't need to cover it up by saying, oh, well, the, the need for this thing is so great. And we don't need to try to emotionally manipulate or argue with others. We simply say, it's how you follow Jesus. It's how I care for my neighbors. And I'm happy about it. Yet I do think in our world today, we need a little bit more focus. In fact, look at number five on your sheets there. Number five on those green sheets. We live among a scoffing and scornful people. Indeed, we ourselves are often scoffing and scornful people. Indistinguishable from those around us. Woefully leaving us anything but blessed and happy, happy, happy. So, as suggested there in number five, an inventory of everyday life would do each of us well to see when we're sitting with the wicked or standing with the saints. And I suspect the changes to make are quite simple. Perhaps hard to do, perhaps hard to stick with, but quite simple to identify and wrap our minds around. But what happens as a result of acting on that inventory? Right? As, as those who are baptized and anointed, what happens as a result of acting on that inventory? The Sermon on the Plains suggests that we will know God's blessings instead of woes and condemnations. Psalm 1 suggests that we will stand upright, that our lives will be successful. That is, we will accomplish God's intention and will more than our own, rather than our own, right? As in the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done. Jeremiah specifically mentions a lack of anxiety, which really is our media-driven lives in a nutshell. Wouldn't that be nice? No anxiety? But also, our lives will bear fruit for the sake of others, to be given away to those who need it, to those who don't have it, to those who are not standing with us Yet, in other words, it becomes one more way to show and tell about Jesus, to introduce my friends to my friend Jesus. Amen.